Welcome back to another video. In today's tutorial, I'll guide you through the process of setting up and configuring a fire cluster. We'll also explore how to check the status of a fire cluster and discuss the factors that can lead to a fire cluster triggering a failover. Take a look at this connectivity overview diagram. This is how you should connect two devices and create a working fire cluster. Utilizing WatchGuard Fire Cluster allows you to set up a cluster with two devices, enhancing network performance and scalability. This configuration serves to prevent network disruptions in the event of hardware or software failures. Before I show you how to configure a fire cluster, there are a few important things you should know. Oh, by the way, we have a great giveaway from our sponsor, MultiCloud. MultiCloud is an online cloud storage manager that allows users to link their various cloud services to a single site. Here you can transfer files, preview documents, and generally make better use of the storage facilities. Get your 200 gigabytes cloud to cloud data transfer traffic for lifetime. The service is GDPR compliant and reliable. When creating a cluster with two devices, it is imperative that they are of the identical model and are running the same version of the Fireware OS. I want to point out that each device in a Fire cluster must have an active live security subscription. Have the feature key for each Firebox saved in a local file. You will need an Ethernet cable for each cluster interface. One network switch for each enable trusted, optional, custom, or external interface. Ethernet cables to connect the interfaces of both devices to the network switches. Lastly, when configuring a fire cluster, we advise utilizing WatchGuard System Manager's Policy Manager as setting up or managing a fire cluster through the Fireware Web UI is not feasible. Before diving into the fire cluster configuration in the user interface, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and leave your comments in the section below. Now, let's go over some fire cluster terminology. A device within the fire cluster is referred to as a cluster member, and every cluster consists of two members the cluster master and the backup master. The cluster master is responsible for updating and managing the cluster's connection and session details. It syncs this information with the backup master, which, in turn, monitors the cluster master and seamlessly assumes the cluster master role in case of a failover. When building a fire cluster, you have two configuration options. You can configure an active passive fire cluster or an active active fire cluster. In an active active fire cluster configuration, the cluster devices jointly handle the traffic flowing through the cluster. The cluster master allocates connections and if one cluster member fails, the second device takes over the connections assigned to the failed device and manages the entire load. To enhance both redundancy and load sharing in your network, opting for an active-active cluster setup is recommended. In an active-passive fire cluster setup, the active device manages all network traffic. Should it experience a failure, the passive device seamlessly assumes control of the connections originally handled by the failed device, as the traffic load is concentrated on one device at a time. While an active-passive cluster provides redundancy, it doesn't contribute to increased scalability. When setting up a fire cluster, it's essential to allocate a cluster ID number for identification purposes. On M290 devices, the default ID number is 50. Although the cluster ID might appear inconsequential, there are instances where its significance becomes apparent. It is advisable to consult the Fire Cluster help documentation for additional information. Every device within a Fire Cluster requires its own unique feature key. When you activate a Fire Cluster, the functioning of subscription services, VPN licenses, and upgrades for cluster members follows a specific protocol determined by your Fire Cluster configuration. While each device in a Fire Cluster must have an active Live Security subscription license, the licensing for other features is contingent on the type of Fire Cluster you implement. For an active active cluster, both devices must possess active licenses for the same set of subscription services, such as Web Blocker, Application Control, Gateway Antivirus, and so forth. In an active passive Fire Cluster, only one device is active at a given time. Consequently, this active device utilizes the subscription services that are active for either cluster member. For a more comprehensive understanding of how licensing is managed within a Fire Cluster, it is advisable to refer to the Fire Cluster help documentation. 
Before activating the fire cluster feature, ensure that you have the necessary hardware to set up your fire cluster. Plan the IP addresses and interfaces to be used and deactivate any in use interfaces in the configuration file. For this demonstration, I will employ specific interfaces and IP addresses, connecting them as illustrated. If you're configuring an active passive cluster, as I will shortly, ensure that your network interfaces are set up in mixed routing or drop in mode. For an active active cluster configuration, your network interfaces must be in mixed routing mode, as Fire Cluster does not support bridge network mode. To configure a Fire Cluster, you have two options. Run the Fire Cluster Setup Wizard or manually configure the Fire Cluster. I have two M290 devices for this demonstration. We need to configure one of them and keep the second to its default out of the box settings. No configuration needed for the second device. Let's start configuring our first device. Open a web browser window and navigate to 10.0.1.1. Use port 8080 which is the default web UI port. Use the default credentials to log in. The username is admin and the password is readwrite. After you log in, the setup wizard pops up. Select, create new configuration, accept the terms, and click next. Keep the default DHCP settings for the external interface. Add any DNS server you want according to your needs. Now, assign the IP address for the trusted interface and set your DHCP range. I will keep the default values for now. Next, change the status password and the admin password and click Next. You can set an IP of a remote computer here and allow only that IP to manage the device. I will leave this blank. Next, Assign a device name. I'm keeping the default here too. Now choose your time zone. It is important for the device to have a correct time zone. Click next all the way to the end and finish the wizard. Now let's log into the device again from the web UI. Nothing special about this as the device now has its default configuration. Let's go ahead then and download the WatchGuard system manager. Head to watchguard.com. Click support at the top right corner. Go to Download Software. Select your device model from the list. I'm using M290 devices. Find and download the latest WatchGuard System Manager software. Locate the file you downloaded and start the installation. The process is simple. Just hit Next all the way to the end. Now launch the WatchGuard System Manager software. Log into the device using the status password you configured previously. You should see the device name along with its Fireware OS version. If you want, you can click on the cross icon to view which interfaces are enabled. Now, click on the Policy Manager from the top menu. The Policy Manager pops and we can see the default policy configuration. The process is very simple up to this point. It is also simple to subscribe to our channel. Just hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. To illustrate this process, We'll utilize the Fire Cluster Setup Wizard. Initiate the Fire Cluster Setup Wizard by navigating to the Fire Cluster menu and then select Setup. Subsequently, choose Active Passive as the cluster type. If you are configuring multiple Fire Clusters within the same layer and broadcast domain, assign a unique cluster ID. Otherwise, the default setting of 50 can be accepted. I will use ID number 1 as cluster ID. In the case of setting up an active active cluster, you would also need to specify a load balancing method at this point. Proceed by selecting the cluster interfaces responsible for connecting the cluster members. A primary interface is mandatory, and for enhanced redundancy, it is advisable to designate a backup interface. By default, the primary interface is determined as the one with the highest interface number, and in my situation, that corresponds to interface 7. For the backup cluster interface, I will designate interface 6. Moving forward, the selection of the interface for the management IP address is required. This interface serves as a direct connection for maintenance tasks on Fire Cluster members. For the management interface, I'll use interface number 1. Subsequently, I'll input the feature key, member name, and serial number for this device. Next, we have to set up the IP address for the cluster interfaces and the management interfaces. Fill in the appropriate information and click Next. Now, let's add the second device. Remember, 
it is important to have the second device as default out of the box settings. Click Import and paste the feature key of the second device. Type the member name for the second device and check its serial number too. Fill in the IP information as you did for the first member. It is important to configure this the right way, otherwise, you will face connectivity issues. Now, click Next and close the wizard. Next, go to Network, Configuration, and check the IP address of the trusted interface and DHCP settings. Close this window and save the configuration. The devices now act as a cluster. To verify that, disconnect from the first device and connect again. This time use the IP address of the trusted interface you configured during the cluster setup wizard. Note that the device icon has changed and it now shows a two device icon. Click the cross to see both cluster members. You will see the master device and the backup master. Open the policy manager again and go to network configuration. Change the IP address of the trusted interface according to your needs. Don't forget to change the DHCP settings too. Save the new configuration. Now just disable and enable your network interface to get a new IP address. This is an important step because we have to connect with the cluster management interface. Launch the WatchGuard system manager and connect to the cluster trusted interface. Open policy manager again and go to setup system. Change the cluster name to whatever you like. I will name it M290 cluster. No space is allowed. Save the configuration again. Right click on the cluster device and select refresh status to see if the setting has been applied properly. Now, let's check the functionality of the cluster. Open a command window and type this command. Open another command window but this time, ping the first device which has the IP 192.168.0.201. Open a third command window and ping the second device which has the IP 192.168.0.202. Now, that all three ping commands get a reply, we know that the cluster allows communication with the network and the internet. Let's disconnect the first device and see what happens. I will unplug it from the power socket. As you see, the ping fails to reach the first device and the Google DNS. This is normal. The second device should take over now and restore the connection. It looks like the connection is restored. The ping command for Google DNS gets a reply once more with the first device still disconnected. Let's go to the system manager to see what is going on. The first device is inactive and the second has become the master device. Now, I will reconnect the first device. It should change from inactive status to backup master. Nice! The device is back online and we receive a ping reply again. Notice that the ping command to Google DNS still has its connection active. Now let's repeat the same process, but this time, we will disconnect the second device. Again, we should see the same behavior. Refresh the status of the cluster to see which device is the master. Switch back to the ping commands one last time and wait for the second device to become active. This shouldn't take long. And there it is. Both devices are up and running now. Let's check and verify the status of the cluster from the system manager. It looks like everything is okay and the cluster is working properly. Thank you very much for joining us on this demonstration. Feel free to leave any comments below and hit that subscribe button so you won't miss any of our videos.